over there. Yeah, you got egg me. on your face. <laughs> <laughs> what does that even mean? You mean the origin? Yeah. I Not, don't know. The, what Where does do you think that it came mean? from? You've got egg on your face? Probably some rude way of eating back in the day. I was thinking like someone threw an egg on you. Oh, that's probably it. That makes... Well, now we have to look it up. Where does... <laughs> where does... Oh, my God. You've got egg. In the meantime, it's episode 210. And Sarah's Googling, going against her true passion, yeah. not Googling. Yeah. <laughs> and... um She's learning things. In the meantime, I just got a text from my mother. <gasps> this is so classic. Oh, please. I cannot wait. Peg is crazy. She said, I don't even remember getting her this, but she said, thank you so much for that map of Jerusalem. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so very special to me. I don't recall oh. buying her a map of Jerusalem. If I did, it was definitely not within the last 12 months oh, even. So... But it's nice. You're welcome, Peg. Maybe another child of hers did it and she's giving you the credit. Is that I something did buy she does? her a map, but I mean... What if it were like of Pittsburgh? It was like two years ago and come on. Did she go to the rally that was in Pittsburgh, the Trump rally? Did yeah. we ever talk about this? She did. I was wondering that. I was like, I wonder if she's there. Yep, support. she wears her dumb shirts. And yeah, I would imagine that. It's so hard for me. Um, just so you know, the expression says that it just, it says to a, have egg on your face means to be embarrassed. Or, yes, I know that. Yeah, I know. Oh. It just says <laughs> that it, the expression originated in the United States some 25 years ago, probably from the fact that someone eating an egg sloppily is likely to wind up with some of it on his face that and is dare so not look dumb. its best. So dumb. That is not the reason. And, and then could you imagine that we're getting so many eggs that that becomes a statement? Like a, a cliche expression? Not like you've got water on your face or you've got like <laughs> a dribble on your chin. It could have been that, but instead it was egg on your face? And who's wolfing down egg? <laughs> like, I suppose Susie. Maybe it's just everybody who is it's going right. to do a podcast. <gasps> oh my God. Speaking of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> you see, maybe you didn't get tagged in this, but okay. somebody, which really shows our play, my place in this podcast, <laughs> um, and rightfully so, somebody tagged me in this ad that I think it was some brand like Forever 21 or I can't remember what brand it was, but came out with a t-shirt called, the style of the shirt was called the podcast co-host shirt. <laughs> And it was like a cut. I did of shirt. see that. Was it on Mod Cloth actually? It might have been on Mod Cloth. Something I think it was. So. And I was like, oh my god, it's. For, and then they were like, hey Sarah, this is for you. I'm like, that's right. Well, no, no because my place. we are both co-hosts. That's a true title. And it was a shirt I would totally wear. <laughs> I was like, that is Sarah all over it. <laughs> that's funny. That is my style. Is podcast co-host. Well, um, okay. Changing the subject back yes. to oh right Pegley and her yes. Trump, oh my god her Trump support yeah. and I'm not a Trump supporter but it actually leads into one of the things I wanted to talk about which was a, <laughs> hold on which Ooh. was weirdly yes an article I was reading about the history of barbecue <laughs> oh it's so, got a smoky past. <laughs> Okay, so you guys know I'm obsessed with like the history of whatever, and I had seen somebody recommend it, and that. But the the article was really good though because it was talking about the racial uh, issues mm-hmm. with regard to barbecue, and I had no idea how long people have been having barbecues. I, well, I would imagine we've been smoking meat for since since we've been eating meat. Right, since there's been fire. Right. <laughs> right. The, wasn't it once the only way to eat meat? <laughs> <laughs> but this was kind of talking about like back in early America, they would have a town barbecue. Mm. So then the pig would be on the spit and you'd all go out and then, you know, it was like an event. Why did they put an apple in its mouth? I don't know. Is that just a thing that they did in like... Disney movies? They didn't... No, no, no. They really do that, but I don't know yeah. why. Um, but this was a co- communal gathering that then would result in things. And this was during this time of slavery. Mm-hmm. So the slaves would make the food for the civic event, but 
they would also like that kind of have come up with plans and like certain rebellions were uh, determined by Mm -hmm. the slaves during these barbecue events. Um, But what was interesting about the article that relates to my mother is that it was talking about how this very famous barbecue restaurant had an owner who was very big um, into the Southern Confederate culture Mm -hmm. and basically racist. Mm -hmm. And he died and now his kids run the thing. And the question is, can we go to this place now that he's dead or is it like... Oh. Whatever. And they were exploring when you have a relative that you disagree with and how we yeah. all have to manage that. And oh, this my God. Yes. Thing at like the Thanksgiving table where like my mom's on the Trump train and, and I want that Trump to derail or train <laughs> yes. to derail. And so, the you know, the questions about like, do you cut that person out of your life or do you try to moderate their mm. opinions or like what's the right what answer? Do you do? Well, we do talk about it. I have pointed out certain things about her beliefs that I believe are racist, and I'm not going to not say. Right. I have not convinced her about anything. So that's why the question is important because it's like, Mm. am I just chasing the wind here? Right. And I'm not really thinking cutting people out unless they're seriously yeah. like in the like KKK yeah. or doing violent things or whatever. But yeah. she's just got bad – she's just made some bad choices. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Hmm. I mean, well, you know what it is? I was going to say, well, the only people I have in my family are all, you know, politically, you know, agree. But yeah. that's not true because I have a whole half that don't – and <laughs> I've cut them and out. you don't talk to them. I was like, oh, I forgot about the people that I don't talk to anymore who agree differently. And is that based mostly on politics or not really? Um, I I think the politics go hand in hand with the religion and the, you know, just like that and side the, of the family. Yeah. You know, like what they're just. That's true. There's a lot of overlap in yeah. terms of behavior, religious philosophy, and then political yes, ideology. Yes, a lot of overlap in the yeah. case of my family. So you can't say it's the politics specifically, right? Right, right. Okay. So they just kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, can't have one without the other. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, and I do see a lot of tweets from people of color that are saying, like, okay, you know, white people that, that are supposed allies, prove it. Like, when you go and are with your racist family members, talk oh, to them, say it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's not always easy. Yeah. And relationships can be very strained because of it. I think you, I mean, even sometimes when there's a, when you like agree politically, there are just things that we learn with each generation where we're like, oh, eh, it's kind of, let's talk about how this is like racist and how this is, um, you know, and we just have like come to almost ignore it. So I've had those conversations with my mom and with my aunt and with my other family members who, you know, have a, who would say that they're very understanding and they're, you know, just the same way I I make mistakes all the time where I'm yeah. like, oh, I got to check my privilege. On this yeah. One. Right. You know, with every generation we well, learn. Have you ever met things, anybody but... that's like, yep, I'm a racist. Like nobody ever no, knows no. that or admits that they are. They're always like, oh, well, I don't think of that, but. That's right. the, the trouble with it. Yeah. Because if someone said they were, then you could talk about it. <laughs> yeah. But usually they're like, I am not. Some mm. of my best friends are black. Oh my God. Yeah. Don't you know? say that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, the article was really good. It was in, um, gosh, I think it was. Oh, it was in the New Yorker, which mm. leads to my next point, which is how freaking great the New Yorker is. Yeah, it is. My friend Eric Schwartzel is a writer, and I remember one time I was with him, and he's so smart. And I was like, what is your favorite publication? Mm-hmm. And he said, it's the New Yorker. Like, it, there is no debate about, like, the quality oh, yeah. of the journalism and stuff. And as you know, I'm constantly... <laughs> singing its praises yeah. on this show and i'm so excited because they are giving an offer to our listeners oh my god are you serious i feel like i won the lottery yeah that's a really good one <laughs> because i mean there is no better 
That's where we're always. The, ugh, people are going to not subscribe to the Brain Candy newsletter anymore because they're <laughs> going to have all the info. I know we're always putting the New Yorker links <laughs> in our uh, newsletter. But it, here's what's so fun: the New Yorker. As a lot of the articles I read are about culture and politics and just what's in the news. But they have such a broad range. They have mm-hmm. cartoons. They have poetry, fiction, science stuff, arts, whatever category, and it's the top level of Mm -hmm. journalism. And so it's so impressive, but it's also so wide ranging and it allows you to inform yourself about current events. You know, I'm into that. And if you're listening to our show, then I know you're into that. You are. And they have an archive that you can get access to every, um, article from 1925. Oh my God. I have a lot to do. You have so, (laughs) we know where Susie's going to be for forever. Yeah. I already have a subscription, but if you don't go to the New York, go to www.newyorker.com slash brain candy and you'll receive 12 issues for $12 plus a free tote bag. Oh my God. That's the best deal. And if you use our code in there, brain candy, you get 50% off of that. What? Stop. Six bucks. Oh my God. You have to just and you get a tote for bag. goodness sake. Just spend more on coffee. I know. And you get all these issues and it's delivered to your mailbox, but it's also, you know, digitally, you can access all of that. I like a magazine though. And, um, you can read something that means something, right? So it's not just like garbage. And not fluff. Yeah. When, when I was talking to them, I'm like, I can't believe I get to tell I people know, to do this, this because great. I cannot tell you how much I love the New Yorker. So go to newyorker.com slash brain candy and use the promo code brain candy to get that deal. You will love it, period. And then like write to us about interesting things you read. Yeah, for sure. Because I mean, they have no shortage of things and they're all different as subjects, as I said. So yeah. it's great. Anyway. Yeah, that barbecue um, <laughs> article was in the New Yorker, so um, I'll put it in the newsletter. But if you <laughs> want to read it, you should uh, get that deal. Okay, Sarah, do you hear about how Alexa's laughing at people? Yes, is that not the creepiest thing ever, Susie? <laughs> <laughs> like it's me. <laughs> what do you think about and it? And why is it laughing so creepy? Right, because it's not like they're saying laugh spookily or and it's whatever. not like it's going like ha ha it's just more like a ha 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 like she knows something you yes know. <laughs> what she the actual does. fuck is that about well p.s somebody tweeted about how my laugh is actually ha 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 <laughs> and i've never thought of it before but now every time i laugh i hear yeah, that tweet in my so mind funny. but yeah did you listen you listen yes. to her and the explanation to me left some uh, right questions unanswered like they claim, so Apple was like, Ooh, or is it Apple? Yeah. No, uh, 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 Amazon. Amazon. Amazon was like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know what happened. Here's what it is. Like the command for it was so simple that people were accidentally, mm-hmm. uh, tri- setting her off. Yeah. It, but some people Mm-mm. said that they woke up right, and she was laughing right. and they thought there was a little kid in their house. <laughs> That's so terrifying. Can you imagine? That's so terrifying. If you had a gun, somebody could have gotten no, hurt. No, forget it. I would be... There are few things that she could do that would be less creepy than that. Or more creepy. You're Sorry. so right. There, I can't think of... Besides straight up saying, I'm going to murder you and you're just like... Yeah. <laughs> just randomly laughing is probably the creepiest thing you could do and then it's like they're plotting to just take over the (laughs) universe well do you think because people worry that yes someone's listening oh they are who's they i i I, I, somebody who's collecting a bunch of data and looking to use it for it's like all comes down to consumerism i'm i i'm sure i think okay but I recently learned that I had, well, not learn. I should say I recently had to turn my TV off to like off of recording me. Like the default setting was recording our voices. Why your TV? Because we have one of those Google TVs, like a Google, I guess it's linked to Google or whatever. And you should just be able to talk and like say, hey, Google, 
you know, find this show. I don't, we, I, we never use that feature or whatever. And thank God, because I was like flipping through, trying to turn the, put the sleep timer on the, the TV. And I found like the, I accidentally clicked the thing that, you know, had a little picture of a microphone on it and said, would you like Google to stop recording your voice? And I had to manually click yes. <gasps> I would like Google to stop recording my voice. <laughs> Has it been this whole time? What have I said? And I know that it's listening, and it's listening to, my husband said when he got put Amazon on his phone, it's listening because his search, like uh, suggestions of things, started changing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Creepy. And don't even get me started on what Boston Dynamics is doing. I don't know what that is, but now you're going to have to tell me. It's the robot people, the, like the, You've seen this robot. The dog? Yeah. Then they yeah, have the other one that can it. do backflips. Yeah, I've seen that thing. Yeah. And then what? now, Why are we now annoyed, can open though? a door. Forget it. <laughs> Forget what? I don't know. Next, all you have to do is put like a heat seeker on it and like then it comes after people. Oh my and then God. Then you just have to say, program it to kill. Wow. You are in a dark mood today. <laughs> I mean, my God, Sarah. This is all this Alexa talk. It's so funny because I don't, I'm not a person who worries about it, but yeah. if she started laughing, oh God, I, I'd be saying, I mean, a should I, tune. but that's the, that's the other thing. It's like, should I be worried about them listening to me? They're really only using it to collect data to like sell me stuff sell that me I probably would love. I'm, or I, yeah, that's <laughs> a good point. Listen, if all of a sudden I really like Lay's potato chips and I don't know why, <laughs> you we, know why I do know why, um, man, I don't know. Well, that's all right. Yeah. Um, Okay. I'm trying to decide what direction to take us. Oh, take us in a Well, I mean, on that note, if I'm going to do this... Robots are taking over. What about the self-driving car that (gasps) ran over? Oh, my God. I was going to talk about this with you, too. Yeah. Zeus. What What do you think? I I mean, I had this thought. I'm, you know, because it's not a short drive to you, and it was raining, and I was like, oh, God, I don't want to drive. And I was like, man, what, how come we don't have self-driving cars already? And I was like, oh, yeah, one just killed somebody. That, <laughs> that's pretty shitty. And then I'm just like, what? Eventually there will be a switch where we decide there are more people who are accidentally killed than there are people who are, you know. Intentionally killed. Inten- or, you know, or at, the, at human error, you know, as a result of. Like drunk driving or texting yeah. while driving, it's just I see what you're it's becoming so crazy. The texting and driving. Sometimes I just feel like everybody's on autopilot and like I see so many people doing oh, it. Everyone. I thought everyone was on the same page. Like we shouldn't be doing. I that. thought so too, but they're not. And I ha- when I like sometimes you know my husband and I and I will be driving somewhere and I'll be following him and I will lay on the horn because I'm like, I can see <laughs> you in the mirror and I'm like honking at him to, to, to not be texting or whatever he's doing. Why is he doing that? I, I'm so mad about it. It's not okay. It's not okay. It can wait. Right? Isn't that their slogan? Yes. And it really can. It totally can. I don't know what is happening that is so important. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, that self-driving car, though, the weird thing for me was that obviously they're still working on the kinks here. Yeah. But it didn't even pump the brakes. It or, didn't. No. It just plowed into them. Yeah. 40 what? miles an hour. Oh. A lady it killed a lady. Oh, no. and Tell so, me the details because I don't really know. All I saw was, was it in Chicago? That I don't know. I, I like just know I that the car was, was going 40. It had matter. a driver in it. You know, is it? It was not a fully, uh, what do they call it? Autonomous vehicle? Automated or like? Oh yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. Fully, it's where it's one of those like they, they have people sitting there in the car. Yeah, so like I guess that's the thing. It's like they have ones where you're still in control, but there's like almost like an autopilot. Oh, I see setting. what you're saying. And then there are other ones. This where person it's could just have like fully hit the in brakes control. and didn't. Oh. She was probably texting Landon. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, probably. Apparently, there was a lady just in the crosswalk. She had the right of way. Oh, my God. And lights out. Lights out. The end. That's... I, I don't know if I could... I mean, what happens to the driver? And 
Is it vehicular manslaughter still? That's what we, I believe that there's a problem in the Uh sense that the laws haven't caught up with. That's right. This situation. That's what Jane McConnell. What if like they drove the car into the (laughs) courtroom? Judge Judy is like instead, like what would be the most judicial car? (laughs) You have to think of like, it's like a Camry. A great Camry. Is the judge. Yeah. With like one of those little judge wigs though, because that'd be adorable. And then like they have a jury of its peers. I mean, and then, and there, like, there would have to be have something like way more adorable <laughs> instead of a gavel. It had to be like some like a little wrench or like Just some a little gas auto. Hose. Yeah, I guess something like that. But like the death penalty is the impound lot. Yeah. Right? Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we went too far. <laughs> Just oh Right. It's over, mister. Yeah, it reminds me of that movie, The Brave Little Toaster. I don't know why. Well, hey. Mm-hmm. Same, same. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was a scary movie. <laughs> Terrible. Well, this is real life, Sarah, and there's a dead woman, and you think this oh my is so God, funny. You're right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's terrible for sure, but it is. There aren't laws in place yet that no, kind we've of got to. This. We have to have robot Who's responsible laws. robot laws. Remember that time I ran a red light in LA, <laughs> and um, I had used your address. Because <laughs> I was just visiting, and oh, then yeah. you got the ticket in the mail. That's right. And there was a picture of me. Oh, right. And I was like, wait, who's that? Oh my God, Susie. That's right. And you're like, I had my sunglasses on. You're like, at least you look cool. <laughs> you did. Oh, that is so funny, but not. When we were renting the Ferrari, not uh, yes. u- utilizing the Ferrari, yes. we it had no, um, it just had paper plates mm-hmm. on it. You know, not like paper plates that you get off of. (laughs) That'd be funny. Yes, paper Um, license. Like paper license plates. Mm -hmm. And we went through the toll roads and we're like, fuck it! Woo! No And then it's like, if they take a picture, I'll just have my middle finger up right over my face. I was like, you won't And they can't find you? No, I guess not. That's a little little, little loophole there. Yeah, but like, how many people are breaking that one? Well, I think a lot though, because I see those paper plates all over California, and that's not something you saw. I saw in Pennsylvania ever. Oh, yeah. And I think where are their license plates? Right. I guess you have a certain amount of day, a certain number of days after you pick mm-hmm. it up or like buy but it. I don't know why, because you have zero days in Pennsylvania. Oh well. So <laughs> those two days you can really real tear strict. it up on the toll roads. We, it's the Puritan roots. Yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> rules are rules. Uh, yes. Wow. That is. It's a lot to take on. We have laughing robots, murdering robots, murdering robots, and then Landon thumbing his breaking nose the rules. at the robots. Um, okay, let me think. Oh, did you see the um, new merch we have in our store? Oh, no. Which one? The pillows, number one. Adorable, like the ones you have on your couch right here. Yes. Yes. And the new Steminist leggings. I love those. Those are really cute. Those are, those, if you are a female in that, well, if you're just female, period. But if you are in the science field, mm-hmm. then you need to be wearing those. They're really, really pretty, but they're really cool. Yeah. And people ask, did they pass the squat test? They sure do. Oh. Like, can you squat in these things? And it's like good yep, at the yeah, gym. Yeah. They are and really you strong. Can't see, yeah. You can't see your bum or anything. Yeah. No and, under, no underwear lines. Right. And it's important. A lot of people have been joining our Patreon and I found a few WTF pins. So I've been like, I've been seeing those out in the wild. I know. People are tagging us on Instagram and shit and wearing them. Yeah. Whenever I ship them out, you know what I'm using? (laughs) Stamps.com. (laughs) Stamps.com. It's, um, the U S postal service is such a great tool for us as a small business, but also if you're just a, a gal who's or a guy who uses Etsy or eBay or anything like that, or if you just ship a lot of stuff, it's so convenient because you can ship right from your desk. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's what we do. We have all this merch, and just to get it organized and shipped out can be really cumbersome. So for us, it's so much easier to just be able to print out the postage, pop pop it onto the package, and you can ship it right from the door. Um, And you can mail anything, postcards, envelopes, packages, whatever. And... They have everything that you need. It's convenient. It's easy, reliable, and efficient. 
And it brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips, and they make it super easy. And we use it because it's convenient. I mean, that's bottom Miles, line. There you go. But there's also good deals on postage, which makes it even more appealing. And you get some free goodies. And right now, as Sarah said, you can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale go to stamps.com click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in brain candy that's stamps.com and enter brain candy it's so easy um okay shall i or i've got a crazy story oh, no. about just like a little little piece that you know i meant to tell you weeks ago so this is now going to be a very old story okay but it's like on the subject of driving so do you know what the uh nazca lines are in peru no Okay. Oh, this is cool. So there are these N A Z C A. Oh, okay. Now they are. They're basic. They're kind of like hieroglyphics done by I think the Peruvian people, who are like Inca people, that were all of um, like animals, but they're only visible like from outer space. They're huge drawings that are out in the middle of these uh, like the desert. And they're I'm visible. Just, I'm giving her yeah. the stink eye yeah. for some reason. I'm like, what? I should show you a picture. Okay. Then, okay, so look at the pictures of these things. Da, 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 da. They're really famous. You know, like you can see them from space. They're, they're, de- they are labeled as one of those, like, you know, there's a name for it. Like some, some, um, oh, now of course I can't remember, but like historical, like natural feature of the world that can't be touched and blah, 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 blah. Well, a natural wonder. Yeah, basically, a truck driver <laughs> drove through them. No, he did not. Yes, he did. You lie. Didn't not lie. Like that fa- is terrible. A, a huge fine. I want to say it's like five hundred thousand dollars. Some fatty fine. And his whole reasoning was he wanted to take a shortcut. No. And thought off the road would be good. Oh my god. Just no sign. Just like this looks like a shortcut. I'll cut through. It's like basically he just took down Stonehenge <laughs> with his car. Right. Oh, can you? When that I read is the story, I was like, right. oh, my stomach like did a little, like churned a little in bit. In their ruined? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, God. just the the in their most most sacred, pure form aren't the same when they've got big tire treads going through them that now you can also see from way up high. I cannot believe that. I know. Is he in jail? No, just a fine. I'm sorry, you did say that. I'm <laughs> I'm trying to write this down. And, yeah. That's terrible. I know. It's really <sighs> it's really too bad. What Deep an idiot. scars as truck driver drives across Peru's two thousand year old <laughs> Nazca lines. And they say women are bad drivers. Oh, oh God, it looks so bad. Okay. Anyways, I just thought that would be and he was charged with an attack against cultural heritage. All right. Well, that's funny. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. But did you see the National Geographic... Oh, I'm already in. ...cover recently of the twins, oh. little girls. They're about, I don't know, 11. And they... One is light skin, one is dark skin. No. But they're twins. Oh my God, I love this already. Yeah. Okay. So Ooh, here's that's tough. super cool because um, I'm trying to get our sound effects up. Hold on. I don't actually have a reason to do that. I just want to just be ready. Make sure I just want to be ready. For any spooky stuff that comes along. Um, <laughs> or history. Or our history. So in an unprecedented move. So recently, did you see on the New York Times how they're running obituaries for women who were overlooked in the past, (gasps) which is super cool. Yes. And they're calling the project Overlooked. Yeah. And they're acknowledging women who should have freaking had an obit and didn't. Yeah. Including Sylvia Plath and like big. Oh my God. Big names. Hello. Yeah. But they had a vagina, Sarah. So. uh, (laughs) Excuse me. (laughs) I forgot. Yeah. So anyway, it, it's in the same vein, Nat Geo is sort of acknowledging their mm. racism and the way that they um, portrayed people of color yeah. over the years. Yeah. Or, and they yeah, talk about how they came about in the age of colonialism mm-hmm. and as a result, their content reflected that because they... Oh, they you mean National Geographic yeah, itself. Yeah. Yeah. And they showed... 
people of color, oh not God. in the U.S., no. but like natives. Oh. And it made us make it feel like it was an other. Like the noble you native, know what? the warrior. I even own vintage National Geographics, and it feels like that. Yeah, I mean the the oh visuals God, are totally so right. visceral yeah. and beautiful and stunning and whatever. But they are all cliches. Yes, about what people of color are like. Yeah, and they're exotic, Aboriginal, and they're, tribal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the editor is now saying, "We did this. Yeah, oh good. That was bad, but it was part of the culture, and now we're." We don't want to be like that. So they put these two twins on the cover who have a white mother, a black father, and then their skin tone. That's interesting. What's interesting is in The New Yorker, my favorite magazine, Mm -hmm. um, they unpack this cover and talk about how it's still problematic because even on the cover it says black and white, um, like undoing what you ever thought about race or something like that. And it's saying like, there isn't a thing like race is the ultimate myth. Right. Well, and they're identical twins, right? They are fraternal twins. Okay, fraternal twins. And you know, what's crazy is my friend Kifla, who was on Road Rules Mm -hmm. Australia Mm -hmm. with me, has twin boys. One is lightest skinned as me Mm -hmm. and one is dark skinned as my friend Kifla. Mm -hmm. His wife is also a woman of color. Mm -hmm. This was just, wow, just how it came out. Yeah. And that was for me crazy to see. And he laughs about it and said, when the baby, the the whiter skinned baby came out, he was like, you guys need to clean that off. (laughs) There's still some stuff on there. Yeah. But I hadn't thought much about it, but I guess this is very unusual. And so these twins are on the cover, but the magazine is still talking about race as if it's real. Right. When we know that race is not real, yeah. but skin color pigmentation is like a, pro- a proxy that we've used yes. shorthand to signify race mm-hmm. that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And so it's this thing, it's the ultimate myth with real repercussions. Oh. So even though there's no such thing as a black race. And it's like a myth that everybody's sold on. Because it's so convenient and we're so lazy Mm -hmm. mentally. And it's such a fascinating article. I'll put it in the newsletter, but you should also subscribe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it really unpacks this idea that, like, we made up race. Yeah. We do have different skin tones. And then we treat people differently, so there's consequences. Right. But that doesn't mean there's actual race. Well, and and, and when you can actually see how you know like we use twins in a lot of studies where like to be able to say oh they're so similar but look at how they're different for this tiny little reason and but in the larger picture they're so similar that you can do these studies well and that's how it should be with race like it well, doesn't matter they're all these all, like they're just so similar it just happened to be that they're pigmentation the same way you can have lighter hair and darker hair I'm going to show it's you lighter skin and dark. That's it. I, don't, the I mean, it's like crazy picture of these twins. So yeah. you can see, um, because there are comments underneath the, I guess where, wherever it was posted and people are saying they both look quote, they look black. Oh, what, what does that even mean? Number they one. Don't. They, and and look at the one on the left. You would never say that if you put her amongst a bunch of European looking yeah. little girls. And the New Yorker points out that Nat Geo did And you know what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Nat Geo didn't talk about like the history of passing as. So mm. like, you know, people of color that then- Passes. Like uh, Rashida Jones. Yeah. Who you know, don't like. Most there people are a bunch don't know people that her are like, They're dad, like, what? She's yeah. black? Right. Yeah. Or whatever, you or know. Or Maya Rudolph is another great yes. example. Yeah. Um, and when I look at these two, the twins, you can really see that, to me, they look like twins. Mm. Like, I can see the the bone structure and the face shape, and they really just do look like twins when you just change the contrast. Of Different the color. Yeah. yeah. Like, mm-hmm. no biggie. They're right. Just... But so... You also got an update that says you gained 91 Instagram followers. So congratulations <laughs> on that. <laughs> oh, my God. Good to know. Thanks, Brainiacs. Whatever color they are, I welcome them. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, <laughs> thanks, Brainiacs. Yeah, so 
you know, it's a, it's a fascinating conversation and I wish Nat Geo had done a little bit more. I'm glad that they're acknowledging their mistakes, which is very unusual for publications to do. Yeah. But they but, did. They played a pretty significant role in... Like tribalism yeah. and all that yes. weird, exotic... A- absolutely. I mean, you look through the 1950s uh, National Geographics and it definitely feels like... Like, it's almost tribal like a culture. zoo thing. Yes, it is. It yeah. totally is that. And oh my God, one, I used to teach um, after school like art programs to elementary schools and I would do collages and I'd bring in magazines and I totally thought there'd be nothing wrong with the National Geographics. In fact, I went for the old school <laughs> ones. That's hilarious. Because they don't have all the advertising in it like well, new ones. They have some but other they things do in there. have boobies. And don't you think that those <laughs> elementary school kids ran up to me and they pointed out the tribal women who were shot. Well, and that's the other thing topless. pointed out is that they were often unclothed. Right. And, and they made them look like um other. Yes, yeah. other. That's the best way to put it. And and not like colonized. Well, which is fucked up cuz really we should now we're going all we're realizing that we had it all wrong. Yeah. I mean, that's, we are all on that journey of learning for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> but I mean, no matter yeah. what color your skin is, I know that you want it to look great. That is fact. <laughs> Something, National Geographic, you can print that. <laughs> and the great thing about our favorite skincare routine, BioClarity, is that it is such a soothing, wonderful, natural product it doesn't irritate your skin, doesn't cause res- redness, but will help you with those problems of acne, blemishes, and things that are frustrating that everyone knows I have dealt with all, all since basically I had it as a teen, but then it came back after I got pregnant oh, with yeah. Lincoln and never went away. Um, but you should try this because it's a three-part system. I've just made it part of my routine and you should too. And... It's just so easy. I just do it every day. And they're offering our listeners a deal. Here's the scoop. Go to bioclarity.com and you can get your first month for only $9.95, which is a $20 savings plus free shipping. And it's a risk-free, 100% money-back guarantee. So I always feel like just give it a try, Try see if it works for you. Get into the routine, use it for a while, and see what the results are on your skin. And you'll be really happy. I know it. Um, Regardless of the lighter darkness of your skin. No clarity does not describe (laughs) And neither do we. Um, But I did want to bring up, you made me think of this when we were just talking about the Nat Geo thing. There was a story that came out recently about a statue of a gorilla at a park, like a kid's park. Mm -hmm. And the statue was one that kids like to climb on. Yeah. And so it became dangerous because it wasn't super like uh, sturdy or okay. whatever. So then they put a, a cage around it. Oh no. And so then, then it became a gorilla in a cage. <gasps> mm, and, I don't like that. Okay. Why? Tell me why. Because like it's, it's symbolic of, okay. First of all, what, what was the statue of the gorilla there to represent to begin with? That is what I do not know. Because it seems like. <laughs> what? When you put a cage around it, to, that's fucked up. Like, that's what we're doing in general. Like, oh, go, go ahead, white people, slap another cage on it. Like, that's what it feels like. Well, so people complained and said it was racially insensitive. Yeah, I mean. That uh, I don't get, but I'm, I want to know. Like, I don't I understand. I mean, I can understand how you can say that, you know, that it's symbolic of us putting, like, monkeys in cages. And then there's a lot of the, like, relationship between just like historically where they've used those terms to describe people of color, African-Americans specifically. Yeah. But why? And so to put it in a cage is like, oh, well we can't have like, if this, I guess the problem, not problem, but I guess the real thing to look at is if, what does the statue on its own represent? And if it, to you, it represents something that's like, the, the question that you and asked, and then you put a cage on it, then there's like the question that you asked about, like well, why is there a gorilla statue, is the most important question that yes. was not addressed in that's the, the most important because what was it? Who put this there? Yeah, I mean, and I think we shouldn't put a cage around it. 
And also well, just they like were just tie doing it down to the ground s- and like make let, let the kids fucking climb on it. Don't put a <laughs> here's the deal. Don't put a statue in a park that children are going to play on that is not allowed to be climbed on. Right. That's the, I have the biggest. They problem made with that. several mistakes. Apparently. So many. First mistake: <laughs> bad placement of a statue. And they didn't make. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna put this statue (laughs) right next to an actual jungle gym, and then we're gonna tell people to not treat it like a fucking jungle gym. But then, okay, let's say you went to the park and you saw it. Yeah. Would you be like, uh oh? Well, here's the here. What uh oh? What? Well, because I know when I went to the park in well, when I went to Central Park and I saw the Alice in Wonderland statue. Oh, you know I climbed all over that shit. I sat on his lap. Did it say not to? Mm, good question. Because some of them, I don't think they it, care. Even if it said don't climb on it, I would still climb on it. I would have to okay. sit on his lap. Just like I did the Little Mermaid statue in Copenhagen. Oh, my God. Where are you seeing all these great statues? Oh, oh, C- Copenhagen. <laughs> and, <laughs> and New York. Central New York. Park. <laughs> you, too, can see the exact same ones if you visit If you left locations. your house. <laughs> ever. Yeah, no, I've never seen that. But I guess, okay... Yeah, and if you are going to put a statue of a, anything in a park, maybe go ahead and make it sturdy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but in, then if it's not, maybe instead of putting a cage around it, you just remove it. Make it sturdier. It. Also, <laughs> like, what is what costs more, to put a cage around it or to put some, like, uh, no pun intended, gorilla glue on that thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's the only logical glue to use in this scenario. For like a million reasons. <laughs> That's a very good point, Sarah. Um, but uh, I do have complaints oh. about glue. Because <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> it smells, apparently it smells like bananas and dogs are attracted to it and they'll eat it. And then the glue will expand in their stomach and kill them. So you got to keep your dogs away from Gorilla Glue. What? The more you know. What happens? There's a smell to Gorilla Glue that smells like bananas and dogs are attracted to how that smells, and they're like, mm, hey, I want to eat that. You know what? I have to tell you. Dogs are dumb, and they eat everything? Is that what you're going to say? No. Oh. The Gorilla Glue people, real cute idea. Okay, it yeah. smells like bananas. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. like, why don't you save a few pennies on the old perfume edition right. and get rid of that feature? Right. You're not going to lose any consumers. Right. And We're you might save a it. dog or two. Right. What if it, of- it's because it smells like, like, donkey dicks? Well, if you did. <laughs> What it, the worst would be if your dog was like, "Fuck bananas! I love doggy dicks." <laughs> and then after that, even more. <laughs> I've been silent laughing for thirty seconds. People might think me picturing me just staring at you in silence, but I'm actually weeping. <laughs> what if the banana glue was actually? A- Less of a dog. <laughs> they were trying to save dogs. And they're like, they hate bananas. Yeah, they don't like produce. <laughs> they love dog and dick. <laughs> I cried. I'm, we're going to have to take this out. Oh my God. <laughs> the most they laughed sometimes <laughs> the least funny thing we've ever <laughs> said sometimes i try to defend what we do like no you know what like we really try to talk about books and <laughs> there's nothing here <laughs> oh my god this is that's terrible. funny as fuck though <laughs> <laughs> we should read up on that about those gorillas <laughs> This is a really awkward segue then because my next guest <laughs> is a gorilla. <laughs> it's a donkey dick. <laughs> oh Lord. Oh, that's so funny. No, I thought it was going to be the perfect segue because <laughs> the, ne- the author who I will be having on the show momentarily, uh, wrote a book called <laughs> Jesus. I don't know how I'm going to recover. <laughs> she wrote a book called what are you, what you are getting wrong about Appalachia and it's in response to hillbilly elegy and mm. white trash all these books that came out recently you're trying to be no, super I, serious I, I it's so serious <laughs> anyway she wrote the book in response to those books that were super popular about like Appalachia and how like they're misunderstood and like it whatever and she's saying 
in response to that, that it's almost like they're ignoring the black population of I Appalachia. Think so. I think they are. Yeah. And that, that hillbilly elegy and white trash are just like, they're white people and they're misunderstood and here's their culture and they're like, whatever. And she's like, um, yeah. okay, anyway, so here's the actual truth. Yeah. She's a scholar and her name is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cat C-A-T-T-E. It's a really uh, great book. It's not super long, so it's really accessible. And I was intrigued by her argument because I had just accepted that these books that had come out that were all the rage were like yeah. onto something. Are you one of those, like, what's your feeling on... Um, oh, God, you make me laugh. Sorry. The... What's the flag that I don't like? Confederate? Confederate one. <laughs> <laughs> so like, what's, what's the flag the I hate? Flag I don't like? um, what's your feeling on the people who say that the Confederate flag is part of U.S. history? I would say they're right and yeah. that, that it should be the same way that Hitler is a part of German history. Right, okay. That, yeah, good. We're on the you know, it's that. history. Yeah. But there's like people... Uh, I was watching, of course, the show on Viceland that I love, Hate Thy Neighbor, that had a... Uh, gentleman who's African-American who was all about defending the Confederate flag. Yeah. Well, that's fine for him, but he shouldn't. And then you find <laughs> out he was adopted by white parents. Oh, and no. And I was like, oh, I bet if you grew up in a different house, you might think a little different. <laughs> I couldn't help but think that. Or not. I mean, he's entitled to his opinion, but... Right, and I'm not going to tell people, like, you know, especially when I'm not... I'm like, you know, white girl That's sitting over really here. Talking, but it was weird to me. And I was like, I feel uncomfortable watching this person so strongly defend yeah. something. And he, they, the host even asked him, do you think that this is about racism at all? Is that, do you think the I Confederate flag is that. rooted in racism? He goes, no, not now. I feel like if ever it was, <laughs> it should probably not be it on would the be list of like... 1863 and also 2018. Right, right. That's what I thought. And I was just like, okay, I get that we're like accepting every person and their story and everything, but this is one I'm I would just ask, like... What, oh. what did he say it was celebrating? History. Of? Oh my God. He had a whole bunch of things he tried to say about how... What? States' rights? Not only states' rights, but also that um, the slaves had more power than we think that they oh, did. And some of them were God. running the plantations. Who told him yeah. this? And I think there were a few people who were interviewed who were like, well, you know, we pretend like, you know, the slaves were all just working in the fields where there were some who owned, you know, okay. and they were the ones who were like, you well, know, wielding the whips. And I'm like, that's okay. That's next level ignorance. Yeah, and it just seemed like, oh my God. But these are people of color who are saying this. I know, but it they can still be wrong. <laughs> I know. I But it just seems like to me, it, it was so like, oh my God, don't you get it? That those people were being brainwashed by and like manipulated by somebody else that was like, okay. And the same way, and this sounds so trivial, but the same way when we're on a challenge and will so quickly throw somebody else under the bus when it's not us. Mm-hmm. We're like, oh, yeah, she used to be my friend, but uh, I'm going to vote her in this week because it's not me. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's, it's you know, yeah. a smaller scale, but yeah. the same sort of story. It's like, complicated, no doubt about yeah. that. Yeah. I think that Elizabeth does a really good job, though, of saying, like, here's the history of why we think the way we do about Appalachia, and here's why... It's not what you think. Yeah. And it's food for thought, if nothing else. I like a dialogue. I like, you know, a very popular book comes out and then you have somebody coming in and saying, you know what? I think Uh you maybe missed the mark on that. And I think that's a great conversation to have, especially when it, you know, it's obviously connected to this whole Trump, uh, rust belt phenomenon where it's like, okay, are these people worried about the economy or is there some racial issues mm-hmm, going on? Mm-hmm. What is it? Those are important ideas to unpack. Yeah, so really important. I was re- really glad to have her on, and I hope you'll listen to the interview and, and hear what you think. And you should definitely check out her book, What You Are Getting Wrong About Appalachia. 
And um, all right, let's introduce her. And anything else you want to add before we hit the road? I'm just glad that I got some clarity on the pronunciation of Appalachia. Right. Because I've been saying that wrong for a long time. (laughs) Well, you know, I'm from Pittsburgh. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know why, but it's, they're pretty specific about it. They they are. I've learned this because I've been saying it. I said it wrong. (laughs) Well, whatevs. I mean, as long as you mean well. Yeah, I do. There you go. (laughs) All right, people. Let's welcome Elizabeth to the show. Hello, Elizabeth. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed your book. I'm from Pittsburgh, so I'm sort of like, you know, adjacent to Mm -hmm. the region. And so I just wanted to start by finding out your history with Appalachia and, and what, you know, your background. Yeah, sure. So I am originally from Knoxville, Tennessee, which is um, in East Tennessee. It is, um, I describe it to other people as like Dolly Parton country. So that's most, that's how most people will place where I'm from. Um, I grew up there. I went to school in Tennessee. Um, Currently, I live in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, which is about 30 minutes away from Charlottesville. So I am a historian. I'm a public historian. And we are people who describe ourselves as taking a greater interest in how um, the public uses history in their daily life and how they interpret history. So I do that, and I do a lot of public writing and um, used to do things like work in museums and historic sites as well. So that's me, um, eight generations back in Appalachia. I think that's how far back we go. So my family has been here a while. Um, and, uh, at the moment I, um, (laughs) I think it was just my turn to have something to say about the way that the region is represented. Yeah. Cause like, I I mean, you didn't hear anything about the joint and then all of a sudden a couple of years ago, it became this hot thing, right? Where these books started coming out and getting all kinds of press. What's the deal? Yeah, definitely. We are definitely on the same page that it felt like, I I would say based on my feeling and and sort of, you know, the research in the media that I did for this book, 2014 seems to be the kind of, um, you know, the gate that um, the media came out of in terms of looking at Appalachia. But here's the thing. If you um, are from the region or you call the region home or you spent any kind of time here, um, doing things like media literacy, you know that this thing, this is a, this is a cycle that happens all the time. Almost every generation, we get um, a spokesperson who comes to kind of interpret the problems of the region. Um, we get a lot of diagnostic texts uh, written to kind of figure out what that, so, I mean, if you look at people who are writing about Appalachia in the 60s, in the 30s, um, they're talking about like, wow, people are really frustrated and they're writing like weird books about Appalachia. This is like a thing that keeps happening. So it's very cyclical, and there's a definite pattern that you can observe um, once you dig beneath kind of the surface and put these, um, you know, put these put these spokespeople in conversation with one another. And you obviously are familiar with the the books that came out recently, and this your book is sort of a response to that, right? Mm-hmm. And you're sa- you're saying you guys aren't getting it all all right, so. What was your intention when you wrote the book? Was it to talk to those other authors or to talk to the public? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, my intent when I was writing the book is I was just very angry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to have an, you know, an outlet for my anger. And thankfully that aligned um, to some people, my publisher, Belt, um, who actually do Midwestern literature. But they were experiencing um, a similar kind of fatigue that – you know, there's also a history of people going to like the quote unquote heartland to do um, the same kind of diagnostic interpretations and text. So we hooked up and we were just all kind of like angry together. And that was the intent. I wanted this book. um, You know, I describe this book as an act of solidarity between me and other people in Appalachia and other regions as well that kind of experience this fatigue or a similar fatigue. Um, I wanted to just briefly muster all the resources that I could um, to interrupt this power, this power to define a region, to define a demographic, um, to diagnose, to speak on behalf of people. I wanted to um, put some resources in my my credentials at work to interrupt that um, because it can be a very toxic pattern especially when you're talking about a region like Appalachia that's very economically vulnerable in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of young people who 
um, don't don't come to their their identity or, 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 you know, come to an understanding of their place in the world easily. So I wanted to do something to express some love for people who had been impacted by um, books like Hillbilly Elegy or What Came Before um, and to 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 do um, something on my end to um, speak speak against that power. One of the things that you mentioned in the book is that other uh, people aren't acknowledging the diversity in the region. Do you think that that's intentional or in just the, it's inconvenient for them or what? Yeah. Um, I think the answer is probably both. Sometimes it's strategic and sometimes it's just not intentional. Um, the, Conventional narrative of Appalachia is that um, it's monolithic and, and white, and it has a very homogenous culture, and um, that's certainly not what I experienced growing up in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is a bit more urban, and I'm sure you have um, a similar experience, you know, you know, living in Pittsburgh. Um, it's very different Appalachias that we're talking about, and in fact, I think a lot of people like me who, who write about the region like to talk about many Appalachias and not just one giant region. Um but it the diversity in the region is ignored because people you know often come to um the the region to make sort of generic proclamations about white people and about poor white people so ignoring um people of color helps them do that um and and that's often kind of where where it starts is the the intent is to um kind of Yes, to generalize about about poor white people and um, writing everybody out that doesn't fit that narrative is something that you often see in the region. Um, and then there's people who might read these these stories and and kind of come to believe them, but it's not um, it's not a good representation of Appalachia. And we you know depopulate um, more in the region than some other parts of America. So our demographics are always in flux. But, you know, what we can say is that the fastest growing populations in Appalachia are um, Latino and African American. So this, you know, these these changes in these populations definitely need to be 100 percent part of the conversation that people are talking about when they, they think of Appalachia, even if their intent is to come to the region to talk primarily about um, the white working class or poor white people. What do you think if someone were to say, read, let's say they read Hillbilly Elegy and then mm-hmm. your response, and then they feel like you're just saying hashtag not all Appalachia kind of thing, like mm-hmm. that the broad strokes is, is still representative, but you're just picking like uh, specifics to undermine their argument. What would you say to them? Well, I think one of, I mean, what is generally true about the phenomenon of hillbilly elegy is that this person has been nominated as a spokesperson from the region, um, and it has been quite comfortable, J.D. Vance has, about using his personal experience to generalize about the realities of a lot of different people. So I think I say, I think I say this explicitly, perhaps in the introduction, is that, um, you know, I'm not the person who's made it acceptable to remake Appalachia in, you know, my own image. I would never do that. But if you are a person who um, thinks that that is a good way to understand the region, that you need this person or, or, you know, a singular experience to anchor yourself to when you're getting to know the region, well, why not use my experience to do that? Um, It's not something that I'm recommending that people do, but it's a question and a conversation that I want to open up. Um, If you found one person's experience illuminating, why not mine? Um, Perhaps if, you know, and um, the reason that you don't or the reason that you do probably says something to you about what you want and need to believe about Appalachia. <laughs> right. Well, where did, can you help my listeners understand and, and when they read the book, they'll hear more about it, but where this sort of Trump country narrative came from? So I think, you know, everybody in any region has to have some patience with election narratives. They're just going to get stuff wrong. They're going to generalize. It's a thing that happens. Um, But what really brings them back to Appalachia over and over again, and indeed to a lot of the same places in Appalachia, like McDowell County, which got, you know, half a dozen um, profiles in the New Yorker or Vanity Fair, is this idea that the people who are um, most responsible for Donald Trump's popularity are um, the white working class or poor white people, often conflated conflated groups that are pretty um, different from one another. But it's the narrative of economic anxiety. It's the narrative that um, poor people are just reacting very badly to their economic circumstances. 
Um, and this is the story that attaches itself to Appalachia and it's still continuing, um, you know, as of last week, as of yesterday. And whenever you um, are confronted with this stuff, what is it in particular that makes you the most mad? <laughs> <laughs> so I think so as a person who does political organizing myself, um, I really want people to understand the um, relationship between poverty and voting behavior, because it's generally true that the closer you are to poverty, the less likely you are to vote, whether that's choice, circumstance or design. Hmm. And so when you locate an enormous amount of political power among people that are um, experiencing extreme poverty, those narratives just don't square, mm. right? Because people um, who are very poor just don't participate heavily in civic engagement. And as a political organizer, I want, you know, I want to change that. I certainly wish it were true that poor people had more um, political power than they, than they do in this moment in time. But this is a deflection that often gets made during election years to, um, you know, focus on a demographic that's easy to scapegoat. It's and um, move kind of um, move move the conversation away from people who are affluent and wealthy who subscribe to the same politics. One of the things that I was struck by in your book was the way that you helped illuminate where this stereotype came from. And I am embarrassed to say I had never heard of the Hatfield McCoy feud. Um, and some other examples that you provided, like, I thought the stranger with a camera mm. story was so interesting. And I was wondering if you could expand upon that for our listeners about wh what is this caricature all about? Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's not a single demographic or a single region that doesn't have, you know, unique stereotypes that are specific to the people that are, that have lived there in their history in Appalachia. Um, our, our stereotypes seem to be specific to um, this historic process that is pretty, pretty big here, which is um, powerful people, corporations taking land yeah. from poor people. So um, corporations like the coal industry trying to sever poor people from the richness of the land around them. And they manipulate um, representations of the region to fit that purpose. So sometimes it means saying that, you know, there's a deficiency in the culture here. And that if we don't bring modern employment to Appalachia, if we don't um, bring coal camps and things of that nature, um, these people will kill them. So, you know, they'll kill each other. They'll kill themselves. They're, they'll be doomed with that purpose. Um, sometimes the, the stereotype works to say that, you know, we need to relocate people to, um, some place that's more comfortable for them to live. And of course it's because they're living on land that's very valuable. So this tracks through the history of Appalachia from the forced migration of indigenous people to, um, things that are happening in the West Virginia house of delegates as of last week, this idea that, um, Appalachian culture is based on deficiency, helplessness, um, complacency, and that we need to depend on our betters to make uh, hard decisions for us and, and put our interests um, into politics because we can't do it our, ourselves. Would you talk in the book also about the idea of otherness and backwardness um, and the ways that this has been used against the region or about the region? And I was wondering if you could describe that. Yeah, so um, the idea is, you know, because we have generations of people who have come to Appalachia, so we've had missionaries, we've had reformers, people that we call poverty workers, um, philanthropists, for example, people who are, um, you know, trying to, to address poverty in the region. And because they can never hit upon the right solutions to addressing poverty, we become unfixable and therefore we become an other mm. because it's easier to imagine um, that we are just um, non-compliant sort of defective people rather than that the solutions that have been brought to the region over and over again are just not, you know, working correctly. So these are solutions, for example, where, you know, we might have a lot of political corruption in the region or in a specific um, part of the region and we get poverty warriors that come in to try to replace, you know, windows on the school. Um, and this is a good thing. This was, you know, nice of them to do, but it doesn't address how wealth and power work, you know, in Appalachia. And so their solutions have had really piecemeal results. Um, and so again, 
uh, to, to not accept failure um, on the behalf of the people who have tried to address poverty, to locate it back on us, um, we became an other. And again, this is a very conventional view that people hold against poor people of all demographics. And do you have, did you get any feedback from the people that wrote the other narratives on yours? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, so I am, you know, for, for, for various reasons, I'm sort of preaching to the choir with my book. Um, and I'm just trying to kind of collect voices who are like mine to push back. So, you know, I get um, I get tons of email from people who really appreciated the book. I, I get occasional email from people who really loved like Hillbilly Elegy, for example, and think that I'm being too hard um, on J.D. Vance. And yeah, I so think I, it, I, can handle yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, my point, that's exactly my point. Um, I'm not wealthy. I made like $5,000 last year. I mean, my goodness. Um, I, you know, I work three jobs. This is my reality. So a considerable, a person with considerable wealth, fortune platform, I mean, they can handle that. Right. Yeah. They can handle some criticism. Well, and it's important, right? It's not, you can't just have somebody say something and then expect nobody to have a dissenting point of view or to push back on some of their arguments. That's what this is supposed to be <laughs> this discourse is important. Yeah, exactly. I think um, I, I'm just I'm kind of traumatized by this because I just left the university environment. But we believe strongly, I think, in this idea that there's a marketplace of ideas yeah. and that our best ideas just kind of rise to the top and the ones that are worse um, kind of sink to the bottom. And that's how we kind of deal with people with problematic ideas. We just, you know, have faith that nobody will embrace them. But that is obviously not true. There's, a, you know, an enormous amount of wealth and power behind some ideas. And that's really um, explains more about how they enter the mainstream than any sort of, you know, popularity or connection with the public. And as you sort of begin navigating, I don't know, the post writing stage, you know, where people consume it and then you have to hear their, <laughs> their opinions. Is there anything that you would add to the book now or do say differently? Um, so not so much because I had such a narrow mandate for this book. It's part of a, a little series that can't go over 150 pages. But what I am trying to do as much as possible when I follow up when I'm invited to speak um, is talk about solutions because these don't loom large in the book. Um, but it's important for me to talk about. And so I am um, integrating as many sort of, uh, you know, discussions about politics, philosophy, policy, um, Appalachian in Appalachia in the future into the conversations that I'm having people that are taking place um, in connection to the, the reception of this book. Well, I congratulate you on it. I really enjoyed it and I hope people read Thank it. You. I think it's so interesting and important. Um, and we ask everybody one last thing, which is what do you keep in the trunk of your car if you have a car? Oh, what do I keep in the... So <laughs> I have a ball pit for my cat in the car. What <laughs> are you even saying right now? So I bought my cat a um, a little cat-sized ball pit. You can buy them at specialty pet stores. And uh, we took him away for Christmas uh, for a visit and took that with us um, and just left it in the car. So hand to heart, what is in the trunk of my car is a cat ball pit. Yes. <laughs> You know, this might surprise you, but nobody has said that yet. <laughs> oh, excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm excited. Thank you. Wow. Well, oh my God, that's one lucky cat. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. I I hope our listeners enjoy the, the book as much as I do. Can they follow you on social anywhere? Yeah. So I'm on um, Twitter and Instagram, the usual places. I have a website and um, I can just be found through my name, which is Elizabeth Cat. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I will let you know when we post the episode. Okay. Thanks. I hope you have a really great day. You too. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.